thing is this. <clears throat> when, you, when, you, when your encounter with God conflicts with your unconscious lens, it's time for a new prescription. And here's the thing about lenses. You know, you will need a lens change almost at least one every single year. Yeah. Why? Because we're growing up in God and our vision needs to change. You know, vision is not about the direction you're going in. It's about the height at which God wants you to travel. And, you know, there are too many churches uh, that have a crop duster mentality. You know, they just spray everything. They're like a Labrador that can't stop peeing. They just spray everything. I'm English. We sometimes lapse into stuff like that. So, You know when you're sat in a plane and, and you get out the, um, the in-flight, the, the airline magazine? There's always a page that tells you about their fleet. It tells you about this plane can carry this amount of people. It has this amount of thrust, this amount of, pla of you know, uh, payload, and it can fly this distance at this speed. And they tell you what each plane you know, can do and so on. Vision is a lot like that. You know, it's not just about the direction you're going in on this level. It's about the height God wants you to travel at in Jesus. If we're learning how to be seated with Christ in heavenly places, then the higher up you go, the more thrust you need, the more power you need, the further you can go. We have to examine vision on that level as a matter of height and depth, not just a matter of length and breadth. Yeah? Height and depth is really important in the spirit. How deep is God going to have his roots in your life? And how high can you go in terms of power and authority over the enemy? Because we live on a battlefield. We live in the clash between two kingdoms. So what we're doing in Christ, we have to do it against the enemy. Because he is the one person we hate. We don't hate any human beings. There's one person we hate. And we hate him with a strength and a power that can overcome him. We're in this fight, and we're fighting for people's lives. We're fighting for this city. We're fighting for this state. We're fighting for this nation. And we're fighting spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. We're born to fight. Fighting is so important in the kingdom. But you have to, if you're going to overcome something at height, you have to have a depth in God. The reason that I'm on a mission field singing a Mick Jagger song against the enemy is because I have no depth. That's my first introduction to warfare. I'm realizing I have no depth. I have no sense of majesty. And so God lets me win even though I'm doing something stupid. And it's a lens change because now he says, son, you can't sing pop songs to every demon you meet. It worked this time. It will not work again. What I'm doing, but he arrests me and says, the reason that was all you could do and all you could think of is because you have no depth. You don't understand majesty and sovereignty. And then I began to learn that spiritual warfare is not about taking authority over the devil. That's the result of warfare. Spiritual warfare is about discovering the sovereignty, the supremacy, and the majesty of the Lord Jesus. And going deep into that place so that when you meet the enemy, you're not cocky or confident. You can look at him and say, there is only going to be one winner, and it's not going to be you. You can run towards the enemy. You know? And that's where you need prophetic words in warfare. Because prophetic words are like the best life insurance ever. David gets a prophetic word from Sam that he's going to be king of Israel one day. And then he goes out and meets Goliath, who's standing in the way of him becoming king. But here's the thing about David. David didn't run towards Goliath. 
um, David ran towards Goliath because he saw his future beyond Goliath. You see, here's the thing. This is the, this is the language that the prophetic gives you. I've got a prophetic word that I'm going to be king of Israel. I'm not king today. That means I can't die. So it kind of sucks to be you right now. <laughs> That's what it means. He saw a future beyond Goliath. So he ran to at Goliath because he knew he couldn't lose. Prophecy is the best life insurance ever. <laughs> Hey, here's a major lens change. Listen to this one. Romans chapter 6. This is fabulous. <clears throat> Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if and we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he that is who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again, death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. The Bible says that <clears throat> Jesus was slain before the foundation of the world. In other words, before Genesis 1-1 was spoken, there was a conversation in heaven. We're going to make this world, we're going to populate it with people, and we're going to teach them how to be like us. How to be as peaceful as us, as calm, as loving. How to laugh like we laugh at things. How to be as happy as we are, yeah? And um, conversation's going well. But we need, you know, we need to make sure um, that they're choosing us. We don't want clones or robots, you know, because God knew about robots way back then, you know. <laughs> we don't want clones or robots. So we're going to give them free will. That means... They have the freedom not to choose us. So they're talking about that. Okay, so if people don't choose us, what if they go a long way down that road of not choosing? Even to the extent where they don't believe we exist. Uh, what if they get so far down that road, they, call, they start a new religion called atheism, which means there is no God? Conversation. And the conversation changes to, well... What do we do for all those people who don't choose us? How do we bless them? How do we be ourselves to them, which is loving, kind, generous, merciful, gracious? How, do we, how, how can we bless them? How can we touch them? How can we reconnect those people to us, even if they don't choose us? So at that point, it's agreed that at a given point in history, Jesus would come and be the sacrificial lamb that takes away the sins of the world. Yeah? So, <clears throat> so it's fixed. A given point in time, Jesus would come and take away the sins of the world, and the way would be open for people to be restored to God, and they'd call it salvation and so on. Then the question becomes, okay, so now that we've got them a, a way open for them to come, um, how are we going to change those people you know, from what they are, from sinners into saints, and from the unrighteous to the righteous and so on. How do we change them to make us, you know, to make them like us? What does that change process even look like? And so they're thinking about it, you know, and so uh, we, yeah, we need to like 
get them to stop thinking about behavior and start thinking about identity. We need to get them moving towards, but what if they keep making mistakes and keep going back and, you know, two steps forward, three steps back and, oh, we'll just keep on and persevere and so on. And, and then the question we go, well, who's going to oversee that part? And the father says, well, you know, I'd love to help, but I've got universes to create. And Jesus said, you know, I'd, I'm happy to be involved somewhere, but, you know, I mean, I'm the sacrificial lamb that, you know, starts this whole thing off. So they're both looking sideways at the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and he's going, hang on a minute. This doesn't sound fun. That all I'm doing is, like, changing them and upgrading them, and they keep falling back, and I have to keep doing this, and... I don't want that job. <laughs> I don't want that job. That just sounds stupid. I don't want that job. We need to rethink this thing because honestly, that is just so boring. So let's rethink it. And so one of them comes up with the idea of, hang on a minute. What about, what about, what if we don't change them? What if we kill them? What if we kill them? And um, so when Christ is on the cross, why don't we put them on the cross with him so that when he dies, they die. And then when he gets buried, they can be buried. And then when he gets resurrected, we can resurrect them to a new life. So we kill off the old and we give them a totally new life. And then Holy Spirit, you get the job of telling them what that new life is really like. And like going, that's a brilliant idea. <laughs> and they're on a roll right now. It's just before lunch. They're on a roll right now. It's like, yeah, you know, we, we can even like have a ceremony. We'll call it, we'll call it baptism. Right. And we'll like, we'll model this whole thing of going into the grave so that when they come out, they're a brand new person and the old life is dead. So they don't have to work on the old life. They only get to work on the new life. And they're all high-fiving each other. And so they made sure that Romans 6 got written. Because that's what it is. Yeah? So here's this whole thing is now, so what that means then, Romans 6 actually means is, when God looks at you, he doesn't see anything wrong with you. Because everything that was wrong about you, he killed it off on the cross. Yeah? So... Turn to your neighbor and say, you are so dead. <laughs> You're so dead. So, when God looks at you, he doesn't see anything wrong with you. Because everything that was wrong about you, he nailed it to a tree. He put it onto Jesus. When Jesus died, you died. Didn't, Jesus didn't just die for you. He died as you. And when he was buried, you were buried. When he was resurrected, so were you. And God gave you a new life, and the old one is dead. What does that mean? It means that God is not working on your sin. He's already dealt with it. He's working on your righteousness. Yeah? Yeah? He's not, what it means is God is not sin conscious towards you. He's righteousness conscious, conscious towards you. He's working on your holiness and your righteousness. That's why he gave you the Holy Spirit to teach you how to become holy. So God is upgrading your righteousness. He's not dealing with sin. He's dealt with it once for all. all. What that means then is that when we come to salvation, you know, there is a present past aspect in salvation and a present future aspect. The present past is when you come to Christ and you come to the cross, people need training on what the cross really is. 
and how that the cross deals with everything in our past and puts it under the blood so it no longer speaks of failure. And we tell people that you're dead, that there's nothing from your past that can come through and affect you in the present. Now, any traumas, any demonic associations and so on, they all get broken off. And that's where the first level of pastoral ministry kicks in. That's where the first level of counseling kicks in. It's present past to get you free, to set you free, to cut all those ties, deliverance if it's required, all that kind of tra stuff, trauma and everything gets dealt with first level pastoral ministry, present past. Once we've got you free from those things, then we have to move you to being present future. This is about discipleship and mentoring. And this is where counseling level part two kicks in because counseling level part two trains you in how to be like Jesus. It trains you in righteousness. It trains you in good habits. It trains you to be present future. That means you're living now with an eye on who you are becoming. This is where we bring prophetic ministry to bear in people's lives because God wants you to have a future and a hope. And the brilliant thing about present future counseling is that we know that God is not dealing with our behavior. He's dealing with our identity because identity is the key to transformation. When you know who you are in Jesus and who you are becoming, what you need is help to become that. So you get help at the right level. Yeah, so that means that in terms of accountability, God is not calling you on your behavior He's not calling you out on your behavior. He's calling you up to your identity. Because accountability is this. Hey, dude, you don't need to be doing that because this is who you are. You don't, that, that's not your, you don't need to be doing that stuff anymore. This is who you are. So present future is we're not dealing on our old self because it's dead. So Ephesians 4, 20 to 24 says... Lay aside the old man, be renewed in the spirit, of your, the spirit of your thinking, and put on the new man. The Bible doesn't tell us to work on our sin, it tells us to work on our righteousness. That righteousness is a gift of God to get you going, and you're learning how to be right. You're not learning how to avoid sin, you're learning how to be made right. You're learning how to live right, think right, see right, do right, speak right, righteousness. That's what we're learning. But nothing we're learning in Christ can ever start with a negative, right? It only has to start with a positive of who Jesus is for us. So we're learning here then that God is not working on our old man and he doesn't want you working on it. He says, lay it aside. Okay, guys, you've been driving this clunker around for 25 years. It's an embarrassment. Your kids are embarrassed. Your wife is embarrassed. Your neighbors are embarrassed. Police are embarrassed to pull you up <laughs> on the side of the road. It's an awful car. It's horrible. It smells. It's disgusting. And then someone gives you a brand new car and they're both sat in your driveway. Which one do you drive? It's a no-brainer, right? You're going to set fire to that old car yourself. You can't take it anywhere because people don't even want the parts. I don't want the tires from that car. Forget that. I'm not putting those tires on my car. No, sorry, dude. Appreciate the offer, but no. I don't want anything relating to that car. Old car, new car, no-brainer. Ladies, old dress that you've been walking around in for 15 years, brand new dress that makes you look gorgeous. Tough choice. <laughs> Old man, dead, horrible, constantly needs changing. No one likes him. New man in Christ, brilliant, amazing, astonishing. <sighs> well, I don't know. Lay aside the old. 
put on the new. God doesn't ask you to work on the old. He has never asked you to work on the old. He asks you to get involved with the new. Because here's the thing about God is that he knows you're dead because he watched you die. So here's the thing. If we are working on the old man, you know, if, the, if our gospel message is only about behavior modification, Jesus needn't have died. It's about transformation or nothing. But we can't be working on the old man to cleanse it and clean it up and get its act together. How can you be trying to clean something up that God has already killed? Does that make sense to anybody? But here's the thing, that people who are doing that pastorally, this is what they actually think. They wouldn't consciously think it, but this is the reality of what their thinking is. Their thinking is that God the Father has no confidence in the sacrifice of Jesus. So he would tread underfoot the cross of Jesus by resurrecting your old nature and trying to clean it up. By working on your behavior rather than working on your new identity in Jesus. Most of us have been resurrecting our old man from the dead. So many times we would qualify to be apostles. (laughs) We're raising the dead every single day. (laughs) Asking God to work on something that he's already killed. And honestly, he has no plans to work on it. No, no, we killed that so we wouldn't have to work on it. No, I don't want to work on it. No, keep it. I don't want that. I killed that. It's in the grave. Nice headstone, by the way. There it is. R.I.P. Your name on it. We're not doing that. We're doing this. Lay aside the old man. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Put on the new man. That's a lens change. And, and, you know, it's a lens change that pastoral ministry really needs to get. It's going to be a fight, though, because you're talking about a billion-dollar industry. Teaching people, you know, 14 ways to clean up your old man. Seriously? We're teaching people stuff like, Anger management. Can you imagine that? Well, I talked to a guy once. He said, Graham, if you knew me, if you, knew me you wouldn't like me. I said, try me. He said, well, I've got a really bad temper. I've always had a bad temper. Um, you know, I'm impatient, intolerant. Just bad temper, short tempered, short fuse, sometimes no fuse. Which is who I am. I said, huh, I have a question. Which self is talking? Because I don't hear the new man talking. I hear the old man talking. This is who I am. You're saying that's your identity. No, it isn't. Your identity is in Christ who makes all things new. So which self is talking here? Yeah? You've resurrected something that you're asking God to deal with when he's already dealt with it in Jesus. So, appreciate the conversation, but I'm going to have to say no. I don't want to talk to you about this. Because I've got this weird aversion. It may just be an English thing. We don't like talking to corpses. (laughs) So, honestly, I've got no intention of talking to this corpse. Because all that you're saying here is already dead in Christ. The cross gives you a starting point. It gives you an end and a beginning. So I don't want to go the other side of the cross. I want to be on the right side of the cross. Because no one in their right mind wants to be left. (laughs) Right? That's why we don't watch NASCAR. Grown men turning left at speed. Not good, not good. (laughs) I thought it was funny anyway. (laughs) So we're, we're talking about the right side of the cross, where there's freedom, 
where there's no condemnation. There's no guilt. There's no shame. There's just learning. When we get to love the learning, I'm learning, I'm growing up into all things in Christ. And it's fabulous. I'm present future. Paul put it this way in Philippians 3. He says, you know, forgetting what lies behind, I reach out to what's in front of me for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. There's present past, present future, Philippians 3, right there. Forgetting what lies behind, I reach forward. I press into that for which God has apprehended me for. What are we learning? We're learning about our identity. We're learning the fact that we are righteous. We are complete in him. And we're learning how to stay complete and be more complete. It's a paradox. A paradox is two apparently conflicting ideas contained in the same truth. So, for example, you have to die to live. You have to give to receive. You have to be last to be first. The church is a building and a body. Can't get more paradoxical than that. Yeah? Both and in the same space. Only God can do that. And he's good at it. Yeah? You're dead. You're learning to be alive. Yeah? Reckon yourself dead to sin. And just be alive to me. And I'll teach you what that all means. So all our lessons are about life, they're about blessing, they're about favor, they're about righteousness, they're about beauty, they're about power, they're about majesty, they're about glory, they're about all those wonderful things. And the more we learn to be made in the image of God, the more glorious we become. Because God is changing us from glory into glory. It follows Therefore, the old change is glorious. Yeah. And we're learning how to live in the glory of the riches of his inheritance in the saints. We're learning how to be sons. You know, we're learning how to grow up into all things in Christ. And everything we face in life is about, he's teaching us how to become more like Jesus. So what does that mean? What's the lens change with all of that? It is that life is endlessly fascinating. So we're not intimidated by anything because we're too busy being fascinated by Jesus. And it makes this salvation glorious, amazing, outrageous, brilliant, astonishing. That the only way you can live it is to be amazed. That really your role in the earth Part of your evangelism of the earth is just to have a marvelous relationship with Jesus so that you're always marveling yourself. And then you do things that to other people who don't know Jesus seem marvelous, so they marvel at you. You're made to marvel. You're made to be astonished. I was doing a meeting in a place not a million miles from here. 200 church leaders, and they're they're contending for this whole ground of, well, we need to be working on sin, we need to be focused on sin, and we need the people to change and all that. So they're contending for the old man, I'm contending for the new. I'm just saying, this is what Scripture says, tell me what it says, but Scripture doesn't actually say that. Now Scripture says, Romans 6 says that you're dead, so how do you change a dead man? Can you let me know that? Because I'm really interested, how do you change dead people? You know, because as far as I know, dead people are just dead. (laughs) So how do you do that? How can you have a pastoral ministry that's all about dead people? How do you deal with the living? So then we, you know, we have this mutual debate, which is interesting. Then we have questions, and for two hours, and it's a little vitriolic. You know, some guys are like, you know, almost telling me that I'm going to hell and that God's going to judge me and all that wonderful stuff. And um, so it's two hours of just questions and, you know, um, I had a great workout in the fruit of the spirit. (laughs) So I came out of that session buffed. And at the end of it all, they're just about to quit. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. You've asked me like tons of questions. I have one question. Why are you not amazed 
by Jesus. Your leaders in the church, why are you not amazed by Jesus? When did you stop being astonished? When did you stop seeing salvation, the, the beauty and the majesty and the glory of salvation? And how could you take something so beautiful and make it so mediocre that you could get people pecking in the, in the dirt like chickens when salvation is meant to have them soaring like eagles? How could you change that? into this and think that that is the gospel? Seriously? Why are you not amazed by Jesus? Lens changes are important. Ephesians 4, 20 to 24 is a lens change. Put off the old, put on the new. That God's only working with the new. What does that mean then? That God's only working with the new. Now, here's the thing. We, don't be, we become complete in Christ at the moment of salvation. And what we're learning is what that completeness looks like. But God starts with a done deal and then teaches you how to live in it. So you start with completeness and learn how to be complete. You start with fullness and you learn how to be full. You start with abundance and you learn how to live in abundance. Yeah? You start with everything up front, and then you learn how to live with it. It's glorious because you know the answer to everything before you start. There's some fullness here. There's some favor here. There's a promise here. There's some completeness here. So you're always looking at life the way that God is looking at it. So what that means is when, when God looks at you, he doesn't see anything wrong with you because he sees you through the lens of Jesus. Fullness, completeness, and so on. What that means on the ground in terms of practicalities is when the Holy Spirit puts his finger on a part of your life that's not working, he's pointing to the site of your next miracle. He's pointing to the site of your next upgrade. Because we are complete in Christ, but we are learning how to be complete. That means that we have things going on in our life that we don't appreciate. And probably other people don't too. When the Holy Spirit comes and he puts his finger on that, he comes thinking, puts his finger on it. Let's deal with that thing next. And what he comes is, he comes with a gift. He comes with an exchange. You give me that old thing, I want to give you this. And I want to give you this. And I want to give you the thought that goes with it and the perception that goes with it and the language that goes with it, so that you can start to see yourself, think about yourself, and talk about yourself the way that we talk about you. So we learn that grace is not undeserved favor, that that is the poorest description of grace ever. Because if grace is only undeserved favor, Jesus never had any. Because the Bible says that he grew in grace. Yeah? So... I think grace is the empowering presence of God that enables you to become the person that he sees when he looks at you. Yeah? God looks at you in a certain way and he gives you power to become the person that he's seeing. And so when the Holy Spirit comes along, he says to you, you don't have a sin nature. It died on the cross you have a sin habit, and habits are easily broken. So we're going to work on the next part of your redevelopment. We're working on this, and we have a gift of righteousness to give you, and we have some new thinking, new lens, new language. It's going to be brilliant. I'm so excited. (laughs) And, you know, the Holy Spirit, he's always excited. He's the most exuberant person I've ever met. He's enthusiastic, he's excited, he's the most encouraging person ever because he knows you're dead, but he knows who you're going to become. And John 16, 13 to 15 describes him as the spirit of truth 
who, who just takes the things of Jesus. Three times in those three verses, Jesus said, he will take of mine and give it to you. And the role of the Holy Spirit is to say, okay, we're working on the next part of your you know, redevelopment of your house. We're working on this room. This is what we're doing. Now I need to show you something about who Jesus is for you. And now you need to get it in your thinking. You need to see it. And now this is how you talk about yourself from now on. Because you have to upgrade your language about yourself, yeah? You can't say that, well, like some people who don't get it often say, well, (laughs) I'm a sinner saved by grace. No. You're a sinner saved by grace to be a saint. So now you're saved by grace to be a saint because a sinner's dead. Yeah? We don't talk ill of the dead. It's just... Leave them where they are. <laughs> you're not just a sinner saved by grace. That, that means that your sin is present and all that kind of stuff. You are a, you're saved by grace to be a saint. It's a mindset change. It's a lens change. 